Dr. Peter Bruckner. Thanks very much, Sam. Can you hear me? Fine. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, yeah, I'm not usually invited back a second time, so this is a very uh, this is a <laughs> unusual uh, experience for me. So uh, it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here in such uh, illustrious surrounds as well. So uh, Sam's asked me to sort of uh, give a bit of a sort of an update, a bit of a state of the nation, what's happened in the last 12 months in the world of, uh, in our world, uh, the world of, uh, of healthy living and healthy eating. And um, I did a similar thing 12 months ago in, uh, in Manchester. Uh, you'll see my uh, sartorial uh, elegance has improved now that we're in the, uh, we're in London now, and you know the Royal College of General Practitioners. So you know I couldn't quite get to the tie, but anyway, we, we improved things a little bit. So what's happened in uh, what's happened in my world in the last uh, last 12 months? Well, some important things have happened. Uh, you know, Liverpool are now the best uh, football team in the world again. You know, so um, not uh, this time due to. Ki King Kenny, but to the uh, King of Egypt. So uh, at, uh, they're going to uh, be European champions uh, in uh, seven days' time. Um, on another uh, sporting front, uh, I believe there was an Ashes tour recently, and um, in you know in our in our own sort of modest way, we, we reminded everyone at the ceremony that uh, there were four fingers up for Australia and, and none for uh, for England, which I I wasn't sure what it meant, but someone explained that actually we won four nil. So in case you hadn't. Uh, You'd forgotten that. Uh, and then, of course, the Australian cricket team, uh, which I used to look after uh, until uh, about this time last year. And, uh, and clearly, they've sort of struggled without my, uh, my guiding wisdom because, uh, <laughs> because they, uh, they went to, uh, to South Africa. And they're a feisty mob, these South Africans. You've only got to look at uh, Professor Noakes here. You know, he loves a fight, as we know. And, uh, and their cricketers are, are no exception. And, uh, and it's fair to say that things didn't go that uh, that well in uh, in South Africa with the uh, with the cricket team, and uh, we uh, we uh, tried to do a bit of ball tampering, and we did a very bad job of it. And uh, <laughs> the moral of this story is, if you're going to cheat, don't get caught. And um, so the uh, the uh, the captain and, and the vice captain, uh, you know, got uh, got suspended. Now, look, uh, are there any journalists in the room? I hope not, because I'm going to give you an exclusive, okay? <laughs> I'm going to give you the truth behind what happened with the ball tampering. Now, as a result of my departure, the, uh, the captain and the vice captain, who had been very strictly low carb, got uh, decided to get back onto the carbs. <laughs> and, and as we know, you know, sugar does things to your cognitive uh, function, and uh, clearly, their cognitive function got worse and worse. They made some terrible decisions, and look what's happened. Okay, <laughs> so it's yet another example of, uh, of of the world of low carb. All right, enough of that. Let's get back to uh, where we're at as a uh, as a nation, as your nation, and uh, you've got a lot to be proud of in this country. Um, you've got uh, you're the uh, you're the fat man of Europe, and um, you know you've uh, officially have the worst diet in Europe. But you know, there's a reason why Britain conquered the world a long time ago, because uh, they have very clever ways of getting around things. And the good news is that you'll soon no longer be the fattest nation in Europe because you're leaving Europe. So. <laughs> but you know, things are not. Uh, I mean, we think you know we're sort of winning, you know, with a bit of this uh, this uh, diet stuff. But to be honest, you know, there are a lot of still things that are still uh, still not great. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more packaged food than fresh food, and we all believe, I think, in real food, and real food doesn't come in, uh, in packages. Uh, we're still consuming far too much uh, sugar. Uh, you know, we're, people are starting to get sugar, but we've still got a long way to go, and sugar does horrible things to your, uh, to your teeth. Levels of obesity are still very high. Um, you know, if we look here, if you, uh, you know, add up the sort of 36 and 27 and 3, you know, that's 66%. Uh, Two thirds of, uh, of English, of British people are uh, overweight or obese. And uh, that's something that uh, it's a huge challenge to all of us. Uh, along with that, diabetes has uh, more than doubled in 20 years. And, you know, really, we're, you know, we've, we're not doing a great job, uh, this generation. And uh, we're the fattest generation in history. And for the first time ever, life expectancy is being reduced. Not a great legacy to leave our children, is it? You know, we've managed to improve life expectancy for hundreds of years and in one generation. Well done, team. Great effort. We've managed to uh, reverse that. That's shameful. 
and we need to do something about it. Okay, what I'm going to do uh, is just very briefly go through some of the evidence that's emerged in the last 12 months. Now, those of you who follow the, the, the sort of uh, nutrition literature would know that there's about 10 papers a day come out. It's, it's unbelievable. It's uh, very hard to keep track of everything. But what I want to do is just pick half a dozen uh, of the more interesting papers, I think, that uh, have sort of changed or have added to what, we, uh, to what we know, the main sort of papers. It's been a really important year for research. There have been some really important research, uh, research studies. So we're going to go through the, the last 12 months, basically from this time last year in Manchester to now, and what are the important research papers that have come out. So this one uh, in The Lancet, uh, in a very important journal, of course, looking at worldwide trends in, uh, in obesity. And uh, what it showed is that uh, it continues to increase. Um, we sort of knew that anyway. Uh, there are some people trying to say that uh, you know, it's levelling leveling off and so on, but it certainly continues to increase in both children and adolescents. And it's interesting, that's 40 years. And I'll just remind you what happened 40 years ago. Remember? Low-fat guidelines. We were going along quite nicely until then, and 40 years ago, the low-fat guidelines came in, and that's been a disaster. We've just got steadily fatter and sicker ever since. All right, the important studies of last year, the PURE papers, uh, probably the biggest studies that have been done, uh, 18 countries, 130,000 odd subjects, massive studies. Two papers that came out, the first one, uh, relation to dietary nutrients and blood lipids, and our data is at odds with current recommendations to reduce total fat and saturated fats. Reducing saturated fatty acid intake and replacing it with carbohydrate has an adverse effect on blood lipids. Let's repeat that again. Reducing, reducing saturated fatty acid has an adverse effect on blood lipids. Substituting saturated fats with unsaturated fats might improve some risk markers. And focusing on a single lipid marker does not capture the clinical effects. And even more impressively, the second pure paper, which was looking at the association of fats and carbohydrate intake with cardiovascular disease, and surely, again, 18 countries, 130,000 uh, subjects, high carbohydrate intake was associated with higher risk of total mortality. The exact opposite of what we've been told for 40 years. Okay? Whereas total fat and individual types of fat were related to lower total mortality. Surely, people should be convinced by now. But they're not. Okay, statins. There's still been some more work on, uh, on statins. Uh, and Marianne de Marcy wrote a very good narrative review that uh, wasn't published in the Express, but it was published uh, in, in an even uh, more salubrious uh, journal. And uh, it's a very interesting article that's worth, uh, that's worth looking at. BMI and uh, lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, Sadia Khan, very good uh, paper, came to this conclusion. Uh, and so are these things that we know, but it's nice to have them reinforced in high quality uh, papers. Obesity associated with shorter longevity and increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity. So yet another paper confirming what, uh, what we already knew, but uh, these are papers published in, uh, in reputable journals, JAMA Cardiology and so on. There are still some people out there, maybe they've got something to do with the soft drink industry, who claim that uh, there is no link between sugar-sweetened beverages and obesity. And uh, this paper very clearly showed a positive association between the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages and indices of obesity. Almost 93% of the 30 included studies showed a positive association. Surely there can be no more doubt about that. Verta Health, many of you would have heard of, uh, of Verta Health and uh, they've really made a big impact on the, uh, on the world in the last uh, 12 months. Verta, Verta Health uh, was started by Sammy Inkinen. Um, I had the pleasure of having lunch in Sydney with Sammy two days ago and um, he still looks about 15, and, uh, <laughs> so he must be doing, he must be doing something right. Um, and Sammy is a, uh, an interesting guy, he's originally from Finland, he's a, a champion Ironman uh, triathlete, um, but he's also a very wealthy man. He started a uh, website in America called Trulia.com and sold that for squillions of, uh, of dollars, and he's putting that money into uh, making the world a better place. A couple of years ago, those of you who watched Serial Killers 2 would remember that he and his wife rowed a boat, not just your ordinary rowboat, but a reasonably sophisticated uh, boat. They rowed that boat from San Francisco to Hawaii on, uh, on no carbs virtually, 
and uh, broke the world record by five days and, uh, and did remarkably well. Anyway, Sammy has devoted the rest of his life and his money uh, to eradicating type 2 diabetes. And in that regard, he has set up Verta Health. He's got some great allies. Uh, Jeff Volek, who uh, Karam and I had uh, dinner with a couple of weeks ago, Steve Finney, uh, and Sarah Halberg. And uh, those of you who haven't watched Sarah Halberg's TED talk, you certainly uh, certainly should. There's a fairly uh, fairly potent group of, uh, of supporters, and uh, and this is what they they do. They basically it's an online program that uh, that people or companies in the U.S. because medicine there is basically paid for by uh, by your employer. Companies purchase that for their patients who are type two diabetic, and they have an, an online uh, relationship, uh, which is physician supervised. They also have a personal health coach. They have individual treatment plans and uh, lots of resources and so on. And that is becoming increasingly popular in the US. Now, uh, they've published uh, three papers so far, and there's more to come. Their first paper was their results after 10 weeks. The second paper is probably the most important one. It's their results at, uh, at one year. And just a couple of weeks ago, they presented their, uh, their cardiovascular risk factors. I'm just going to very briefly take you through their, uh, some of their results. This is uh, their, their uh, diabetes results, if you like, HbA1c, glucose, insulin, etc., and uh, their mean improvement. So uh, the blue is the Verta program. The, the grey is uh, standard treatment. And you can see the dramatic improvement, let's say, Reduction in diabetes medications, 40%. Uh, insulin resistance, 40%. Uh, insulin and uh, 35, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty significant results on this, uh, on this program. Down here, we've got their um, average HbA1c, 7.6 at baseline. By definition, type 2 diabetic, as we know, down to 10 weeks, down to 6.5. And at uh, 12 months, 6.3. Again, fairly dramatic. Uh, if there was a drug that did that, you'd, uh, you'd make billions of dollars uh, out of it. And finally, the, uh, the weight loss. Again, the percentage weight loss. And the interesting thing is that uh, there's no sort of kick up again. You know, often uh, in weight loss, you lose weight loss and you can't sustain it. But during that 12 months, and I've just uh, spoken to, to Sammy the other day, and he said their two-year data is very similar. So they've maintained their weight loss. So very impressive results, you'd agree, from Verta, and I think this is really the way of the, the way of the future, and it's going to make a dramatic difference, I think, to uh, the management of type two diabetes, certainly in the U.S. anyway, and uh, I think other countries will uh, will follow soon. So the whole Verta program, I think, has been uh, very significant. Sammy tells me there are five more papers coming out covering these sort of uh, areas: inflammation, triglycerides, liver function, um, and uh, insulin resistance. There are some uh, previews of some of the results that are going to be published in these papers over the next uh, 12 months, and their two-year data is also uh, will be published later on uh, this year. So very exciting stuff, uh, and, and all credit to those, uh, those involved. But there's lots of evidence now for type 2 diabetes and low-carbohydrate diet. I mean, it's very, you know, it's getting to the stage where you've got to think it's almost negligent of a doctor not to put their type 2 diabetic patient on a low-carb uh, diet. I'm not sure that will go down too well with the diabetologist, but it's absolutely true. And here's the uh, results of, of, of Laura Saslow's paper. You know, um, a uh, low-carb diet had greater reductions in HbA1c, more weight, more medications than the standard uh, diet. So yet another paper that, uh, that shows this. And finally, a systematic review meta-analysis of the RCTs in this, in this area. Low-carbohydrate intervention may promote favourable outcomes in terms of HbA1c, triglycerides and HDL uh, cholesterol and demonstrated re uh, reduced requirements for diabetes medication. So really, it's absolutely clear. Uh, as we know, systematic reviews and meta-analyses are the highest quality evidence and there it is. It's very, uh, very clear. So there's been a lot of good stuff. This is an interesting paper on, uh, from uh, our old friend Walter Willett and his mates at, uh, at Harvard and, and uh, looking at a, a combination of lifestyle factors. And the five lifestyle factors that, uh, that they looked at were never smoking, body mass index below 25, uh, more than 30 minutes a day of moderate to, to vigorous physical activity, moderate alcohol intake and a high diet quality score. And they looked at those that followed those five uh, interventions, if you like, compared to those uh, that didn't. And they had some very interesting results. So what they did is they looked at life expectancy at age 50. Okay, so how many more years you're going to live after 50? Okay, I'm at 15 and going strong. Uh, I'm uh, planning on, uh, on uh, living a lot more, I can tell you. 
Um, so the average for those who didn't have any of those lifestyle issues, so they, uh, you know, they, they drank too much, they smoked, they, uh, they weren't, uh, weren't doing exercise, had a poor diet, etc., etc. You, uh, as, a, uh, as a woman, you were going to live to 79, and as a, as a guy, you're going to live to 75. In contrast, for those who adopted all five of those low risk factors, not that difficult, all five of those factors, an extra 14 years for women, so you're going to live to 93, and an extra 12 years for, uh, for men. So, uh, you know, you're going to live uh, to 87. So, very, uh, very interesting results, very dramatic results. And surely, again, you know, it's something we can, uh, we can use to tell our patients. There's been quite a bit about ultra-processed foods. Um, and uh, just to quickly explain the definition of ultra-processed foods, it's this group that uh, mass-produced packaged breads, buns, uh, sweet and savoury snacks, etc. So basically, ultra uh, process means that you have a whole lot of stuff, ingredients in there that don't resemble food. And um, they're, uh, they're incredibly popular and incredibly widely used in, uh, in Western countries. And uh, there's been a couple of studies here looking at uh, the relationship between ultra processed food consumption and excess weight gain. This is in the US. Ultra processed foods provided 58% of the energy intake and 89% of added sugars. Pretty scary. And uh, consuming a high amount of energy from uh, ultra processed foods compared to a low amount, 1.6 times higher BMI, four centimetre greater waist circumference and much higher odds of overweight obesity and abdominal obesity. So again, very clear evidence that ultra processed foods are not great. And uh, another study that looked at uh, ultra processed foods and cancer and found interestingly a 10% increase in the proportion of ultra processed foods in the diet associated with increase of more than 10% in the risk of overall and breast cancer. So if you can't convince people about obesity and so on, at least convince them about cancer. And really, that's what I think of ultra processed food. <laughs> Speaking of cancer, you know, there's more and more uh, evidence of a relationship between uh, obesity and cancer. There are a number of, a whole group of cancers now that are very clearly related to, uh, to obesity. And uh, you can see here that overweight and obesity related counter cancers accounted for 40% of all cancers. And there's consistent evidence that a high BMI is associated with cancer risk. So, We've talked about, you know, we know about obesity, we know about type 2 diabetes, but there's a whole bunch of other uh, diseases <coughs> that uh, we're getting increasing evidence of a relationship between diet and chronic disease. Cancer is one of those. Uh, Alzheimer's is another. And the, this is a uh, paper that looked at the, the uh, ketogenic diet intervention in Alzheimer's disease and... Uh, the, uh, the mean of this subscale uh, improved by 4.1 with a ketogenic diet and returned to baseline after the washout. Now, that's, uh, that's the equivalent of the best drugs there is for, uh, for or better than any drugs for Alzheimer's. So uh, that's, and if you don't, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with that scale either, but the people who are tell me that that's a very dramatic reduction in, uh, in the Alzheimer's uh, scale. And they certainly say it justifies further studies in ketogenic diet. So Alzheimer's is another, another area. Uh, this is uh, autism, autism spectrum disorder. You know, it seems to be an epidemic of that, certainly in, in my country and I suspect uh, here. A uh, modified ketogenic gluten-free diet. And again, it significantly improved core features of autism spectrum disorder assessed by various uh, behavioural tests uh, and so on. So there's a lot of stuff out there that's very interesting that's going to be more and more will come out over the next uh, couple of years. Fertility. The, uh, the IVF clinics back home are now putting their, uh, their infertile couples onto uh, ketogenic diets as, uh, as a first line of treatment and getting, they say, about 30% success with fertility, which is as good as any other, uh, other thing. So this is a study here that uh, looked at... Uh, Preconception and getting study, uh, getting uh, couples to consume uh, when they consume one or more sugar sweetened drinks, they decrease their likelihood of a successful conception by 20%. So simply by reducing sugar sweetened drinks, both the male and the female, both important, 
uh, it can improve uh, fertility, which is a massive problem in our society. I mean, all these, all these problems, I mean, they were around 40 years ago, but they've massively increased. I mean, uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, various cancers and fertility and, and autism and so on, they're, they're out of control. And, uh, and there's, you know, what's changed in the last 40 years? We're doing the same amount of exercise. What's changed? Our diet has changed. And surely there must be a relationship and there's more and more evidence coming out to, uh, to support that. And finally, for type 1 diabetics, this paper that you may have seen, uh, those of you who, would, who are involved with type 1 diabetes would know that there's a Facebook group called Type 1 Grit. Um, fantastic uh, group set up by, by parents and by sufferers of, uh, of type 1 diabetes. And what uh, this group did, it's a very eminent uh, group. You've got Sarah Halberg again. You've got uh, Richard Bernstein, uh, the godfather, if you like, of, uh, of diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Uh, David Ludwig, Eric Westman, some very prominent people in this uh, study that just came out uh, what, to, to last week. Um, and what they did was it was a survey study of 300 people on this type 1 grit um, Facebook group. And uh, it was, I think, 100 children and 200 adults. And then a survey... Those who've, who followed a low-carb diet for long-term treatment of type 1 diabetes uh, observed measures of glycemic control in the near-normal range, low rates of hypoglycemia and other uh, adverse events, and generally high levels of satisfaction with health and uh, diabetes control. Okay, not an RCT, but very uh, convincing evidence that... Uh, what Richard Bernstein, most of you, many of you would know this book. Uh, the, every type 1 diabetic should read this, uh, read this book and every doctor looking after type 1 diabetes should be familiar with this book. Richard Bernstein was an engineer who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 12. Uh, he's now been uh, living with type 1 diabetes for 73 years, I think, which uh, we suspect is the longest person uh, alive at the moment who, who survived with type 1 diabetes. He worked out in his uh, 30s that... Uh, low carb was the way to go for type 1 diabetes and, uh, and thought he had a eureka mo moment, went to, the, uh, went to the medical community and said, look, look what I found. The medical community, of course, totally ignored him. So he said, uh, F you, I'm going to go and uh, study medicine. So at the age of, in his early 40s, he enrolled in medicine and uh, has become a major advocate of, uh, of low carb in type 1 diabetes. As I said, this book is uh, absolutely <coughs> outstanding and he's still going strong uh, after being a type 1 diabetic for 73 years. Um, but, okay, lots of, lots of positive evidence about the benefits of, uh, of improving your diet. But still, there are, uh, there are people out there who don't want to, uh, don't want to be a part of it and, uh, and are negative about it and will interpret science to, uh, to suit their own, uh, their own needs. You know, low-carb diets, no better. Uh, diet quality, not quantity. Uh, low-carb diets will not help you lose weight. I mean, that's, that's almost a criminal statement. Unbelievable. But uh, even the Telegraph, too, a proper newspaper. Ridiculous, you know. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, you know, why, what's, what's going on? You know, and, and you know, I, I think, as we know, we've, we've talked about sugar being the new tobacco. And there are, you know, there are a lot of uh, tactics. I mean, the tobacco industry wrote the, uh, wrote the textbook on, uh, on how, to, uh, you know, how to influence government and, and public opinion uh, to suit their, uh, suit their own means. And, and I think the, the sugar and food industries are uh, following in their, uh, in their own footsteps. Um, you know, just as an example, you know, the British Nutrition Foundation, you know, it's supposed to be the, uh, the source of all uh, wisdom on food. And just look at the, uh, the conflicts of interest that, uh, that they have here. And, uh, and we know that there's just a handful of companies the world over that basically dominate the whole, uh, the whole food industry and uh, are incredibly powerful. And all those brands are covered by those, uh, those dozen, uh, dozen people. But it's all right. It seems on the job. So uh, the science against sugar alone <laughs> is insufficient in tackling the obesity and type 2 diabetes crises. We must overcome opposition from vested interests. And uh, the same Grant Schofield, a professor from uh, Auckland, and Robert Lustig of uh, Fat Chance uh, fame, um, published that, uh, what, three, two or three weeks ago? and a very good paper uh, there as well. So that's sort of what's been happening in, in the literature. What else has been going on in our world, if you like? Well, there's lots of conferences, you know, not as good as this one, of course, but, you know, they try. And uh, recently I was in uh, Breckenridge, a uh, nice place, good skiing, all that sort of stuff, but uh, a, uh, a very illustrious group of uh, presenters there, uh, 
Admittedly, there are a couple of duds, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we snuck in there when no one was looking. But um, they think, oh, he's come all the way from Australia. We'll put him on the program. Yeah, that's all right. You know, that's good. So that's a fantastic conference. Uh, it's on again next year. It's in Denver next year, uh, early March. Great, uh, great conference. Best, uh, sorry, second best, uh, sorry, Sam. Oops. <laughs> Slip of the tongue there. Second best conference I've ever, uh, ever been to. It's uh, <laughs> terrific. Worth going to. Uh, books, well, books, 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 everywhere. Everyone writes a book, you know. So there's been a lot of books in the last 12 months. There's uh, those wrong ones and uh, you know, there's a seam again. And then uh, uh, Verna, uh, Jason Fong. This is uh, Ivor Cummins and, and Jeff Gerber. And this is a recent one by Grant Schofield and the New Zealand group who initially wrote What the Fat and now they're writing What the Fast. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are some fantastic uh, books around there. In, uh, in Australia, there was a couple of interesting books came out. This is uh, the CSIRO is our government uh, body for health and research, and uh, they've actually, despite you know the uh, the government banning our uh, doctors from talking about uh, good nutrition, um, they've actually put this low carb diet out. That, that's a really significant step forward for us because we can, you know, when we get uh, criticised, we can say, well, hang on a minute, the CSIRO obviously think it's uh, it's okay. And this one here is uh, Paleo Pete, Pete Evans, who's a superstar in Australia. His uh, show, which is one of the worst shows you'll ever watch in your life, was, uh, <laughs> My Kitchen Rules, he admits that himself, My Kitchen Rules, uh, is the number one ranked show in the country. So it's a massive thing. And he's been, always been known as Paleo Pete. And all of a sudden, Paleo Pete has become Low Carb Pete. And uh, quite a subtle, uh, subtle difference. And uh, so, as I said, Everyone's got to write a book, and uh, I'm no exception. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll, uh, I'll just put out a uh, fat lot of good. Um, uh, yeah, look, if you can't beat them, join them. And uh, so a fat lot of good came out two weeks ago, and um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's selling well uh, in Australia. I was actually at the, the airport on the way out here, and, uh, you know, you become, you know, those of you who've written books, you become a bit, you know, obsessed about finding your book, okay? So every bookshop I go into, you know, where is it, where is it? So I went to the, uh, the uh, airport bookshop and a uh, big, massive, big uh, bookshop at Melbourne Airport. And, uh, and I'm looking around and I think, you know, it's not on the front tables and it's not on the health section. And I'm getting really pissed off. I'm thinking, bloody hell, you know, people want to read this, you know? And then I looked up at the, uh, at the best, whoop, the bestseller, and there it was. Hang on a minute. There it is, number 10. Just snuck into the bestseller list uh, there, yeah. <laughs> The fact that my mother had been there the day before and bought 35 <laughs> copies, you know, it's nothing to do with it. But that's, you know, I'm, uh, I'm there. That's the main thing. So uh, anyway, fat lot of good. You can, uh, you can get it on uh, Book Depository. They'll, uh, they'll post it to you in, uh, in England. So books, a lot, uh, lot of great books out there. Uh, podcasts, a million great podcasts is one of my favourite. Uh, two keto dudes. Um, two software engineers. It's amazing how many people prominent in the low-carb world are engineers. And uh, maybe they think logically. That's strange, isn't it? Um, but uh, more than doctors, anyway. But um, that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, podcast. And I think we have the, uh, one of the two keto dudes people here uh, today. So that's great. Um, obviously, you know, PhD is doing a fantastic job here. One of the favourite things I, I love from them is this uh, ongoing uh, tally of, uh, of comparing the, the diets. I often uh, show that to, uh, to people now. We're 62 RCTs now. And... Uh, um, we're uh, 53, 7 up, so that's uh, not doing too badly. Um, uh, websites, I mean, there's so many great websites out there. Diet Doctor is still probably the best, I think. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, website. Uh, and as most of you would know, Andreas Enfeld, who started it, uh, just as a very small Swedish website. <laughs> now he has 18 employ full-time employees. Uh, he got a better offer this week. He's off on a cruise, a uh, low-carb cruise, instead of coming to London. But, uh, you know, can't blame him. But, um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, he, um, you know, he gets 250,000 views a day. So you can't tell me that there's no interest in low-carb uh, around the world. I mean, that's, uh, and that's replicated in numerous other, uh, in other websites and so on. Similarly, um, um, in America... Nina Teicholz, who most of you would know, wrote The Big Fat Surprise, the greatest book that's ever, ever been written, well, until recently, the greatest book that's ever been written. <laughs> um, and um, Nina is basically de devoting her time, full time now, to getting the American dietary guidelines changed. And as you can imagine, that's a massive challenge. It's, it's up for review now. 
Uh, she's been lobbying Congress and she's got uh, people in Congress to acknowledge that they're not based on, uh, on the, the, the uh, right scientific evidence. So we certainly wish her, uh, her luck with, uh, with that project. But that's a really important... Because certainly we find in Australia, I mean, until you change the dietary guidelines, until you get rid of this rubbish about saturated fat and, and, uh, and so on, it's very hard to convince people and doctors and, and, and governments in particular to, uh, to take any action. So I think we all need to work hard to change those, those dietary guidelines. Um, websites, I mean, there's no better website than, than this one. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's from the UK, which is quite remarkable. But anyway, it's, it's good. And, uh, you know, it, uh, <laughs> I guess if you can't play cricket, you've got to be able to do something. And, um, um, and, then, uh, and then Tim Snokes Foundation uh, website. It's a similar, uh, similar one in, uh, in South Africa and so on. Um, and uh, I just noticed this week, uh, Tim, that uh, the, the Noakes Foundation and uh, Low Carb USA have uh, put together a, uh, a training in uh, LCHF ketogenic nutrition and, uh, and treatment, and that's, uh, that's just been launched in the last uh, week or so. You can't say I'm not up to date. This is hot off the press, okay? Um, in Australia, we, uh, I think I mentioned last year, we have a campaign that we call Sugar by Half. Uh, it's a campaign to... Uh, it's focusing on sugar, and you might say, well, you know, sugar's only one thing, but yes, it's an important thing. And it's the one thing that everyone agrees on. Even the dietitians agree on sugar, so it must be bloody obvious. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, apologies to any dietitians in the audience, but um, our, aim, uh, our aim there is to reduce the amount of added sugar by a half. And, uh, you know, the World Health Organization says the ideal amount, sort of 14 uh, teaspoons of sugar, uh, it's, it's six teaspoons of sugar. The average Australian's on about 14. The average Australian teenager's on about 25. So we reckon if we can reduce it by half, we'll make a massive impact on the, uh, on the health of Australians. And that's certainly what uh, I intend to focus on for the rest of my career. I'm uh, finished up with my, uh, my team activities. You know, I mean, I've already won the World Cup for Australia. So uh, that's, uh, that's fine. And, uh, and uh, you know, I've already won the Ashes. So now it's time to... Uh, <laughs> Time to move on from, uh, from that, uh, from looking after the health of uh, 11 Australians to looking after 25 million Australians. So that's, uh, that's my plan for the next uh, few years. Just lastly, a few things. I mean, uh, tax, sugar tax, we all hear a lot about that uh, these days. I love this line, you know, cheap soda has taxed uh, this nation dearly as time to tax it back. Um, we know there are now a number of countries and a number of uh, cities and, uh, and, and uh, states in the US that are uh, introducing a sugar tax. Uh, right around, uh, around the world now, 28 countries and seven uh, US cities. Uh, Mexico was the, was the first or one of the, the first to, to do it. They had the highest obesity rate in the world, so that was, uh, that was a pretty good uh, way to start. And you can see their results there. They're, they've arrested that, uh, that climb in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, obesity and uh, they are sugar, the sugar tax dropped 5.5% in the first year and nearly 10% in the, in the second year. And people say, well, you know, we should be taxing lots of things, not just sugary drinks, and that's true, but sugary drinks are, uh, are massive. They're still the biggest single cause of, uh, of added sugars, and uh, so it's probably a good place to, uh, to start. Uh, in this country, you know, I certainly applaud... Uh, it was a long time coming, wasn't it? It was a long lead-in that uh, two years before the sugar tax came in, but... The interesting thing is, as the headline says, it's already producing results. And as you know, you know most of the, uh, of the drink manufacturers now have dropped their sugar contents to uh, not because they care a single thing about the health of the country, but they just want to get under the tax level, so uh, the, under, the 8% or the 5%. But hey, if it works, that's, uh, that's a great idea. So I think uh, uh, as a result of that, and just general awareness, you know, it's not just the tax, it's that awareness uh, around. And, uh, and you know, I think there's no doubt that uh, I'm not sure it's, you know, going to wipe out uh, diabetes. Uh, I'm a bit concerned there. They, they say top doctors, and the only doctor I could find was a C. Malhotra. But anyway, that's, uh, that's all right. Um, but, uh, you know, there's lots of other things happening, uh, happening in this country, and I certainly uh, applaud uh, that, you know, the, the junk food ad adverts uh, and all that sort of uh, stuff. I think, you know, your government here, for some reason, I don't quite know why, uh, someone said it was because... Uh, because uh, George Osborne went on a 5-2 diet, but uh, something's happened here that uh, certainly we can't get that traction in, uh, in Australia. And, uh, you know, juice bans in, uh, in nurseries and, uh, and then most recently the suggestion from uh, London that uh, you might ban junk food ads on, uh, on public transport. So I certainly congratulate uh, you guys on that. Look, there are a number of very senior people 
who are supporting, uh, supporting very eminent, prestigious people. You know, Roy Taylor's one of those, uh, a uh, very well-known medical uh, specialist. There's other uh, very uh, qualified and profound people that are, uh, are uh, you know, very uh, promoting this, uh, this diet. And uh, so it's really, you know, it's good to have these people uh, on side. A quick word for, uh, for journal, for the medical journals. I mean, uh, this has not been a popular uh, cause, the, the low-carb uh, cause. And I certainly uh, you know, would like to acknowledge, uh, firstly, Fiona Godley of the BMJ, who's been very supportive. She published Nina, uh, Nina Teicholz's... She published Nina Teicholz's paper a year or two ago, copped a hell of a lot of flack for it, but uh, supported her and eventually, uh, eventually won out. And, uh, and our own uh, sports medicine journal, the British Journal of Sports Medicine, the editor, Karim Khan, is down here in the front. Wave, uh, Karim. Yeah, here he is. Thank you. Um, <laughs> he's a uh, good royal wave, actually. You'd be, you'd be good. Uh, that's good. Um, you'd, uh, and he's you know, published. And again, it copped a lot of criticism and uh, a lot of... A hell of a lot of criticism on social media from a group of uh, people who, uh, who don't like that. A, a prestigious journal, the most prestigious sports medicine journal in the world, is uh, publishing research uh, along, this, uh, along this line. Just to finish, we have, we have a lot of heroes in this movement. And uh, we're very fortunate that a number of those heroes are, uh, are here today. And I just want to acknowledge uh, some of them. Um, because without them, we, uh, we wouldn't be where we are and millions of people around the world wouldn't have benefited from, uh, from their wisdom. One is uh, Slimology. <laughs> I uh, couldn't resist that one. Sorry, Sam. But, uh, <laughs> but all jokes aside, I mean, you know, Sam has driven this, uh, this PhD uh, movement. It's now international. Um, we've got a PhD collaboration now in... USA, Ireland, Brazil, Australia, and Canada. There you go. Um, so that's, uh, you know, congratulations to, uh, to Sam on that. Uh, um, you know, there are two heroes in this photo. I can, you can guess which ones, but uh, um, there's uh, the, uh, the highlight of my week every week is when uh, Zoe Harcum's uh, blog comes around. Um, I strongly recommend you all enrol in that. It's not that expensive. It is the best reading of the week. She's uh, unbelievable, Zoe. You're doing a fantastic job. Uh, well done. Thank you. And Asim, Asim unfortunately couldn't be here today. He's walking Megan down the aisle in Windsor, so he won't, uh, <laughs> he won't uh, be here until, uh, until tomorrow. But he, you know, he'll be able to tell us all about the wedding and, and so on. He's a very, very important person these days, uh, Asim. You know, we, we all knew him when he was just a seam, a cardiology registrar, but nowadays, you know, he's a legend. And, uh, and of course, uh, David, uh, David Unwin and his uh, by far better half. <laughs> Again, it takes a lot of courage to stand up uh, the, way, uh, the way David and, and Jen have. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, he's copped an awful lot of criticism o over the years and he's never wavered. And it's just so nice to see finally he's getting acknowledged with awards and, uh, and so on by the same people who've been criticising him for 20 years. <laughs> but with due respect to all those heroes, I'm sorry to uh, play you down, we have a superhero here, and that's Tim Noakes. Tim was the person who got me started uh, on this path. I'd known Tim probably for 30 years before then as an eminent sports scientist. He's always someone who's challenged the, uh, the orthodoxies of sports science. He uh, introduced a thing called the central governor theory. Uh, he talked about hyponatremia. And the funny thing is that he's always been proven right. And, uh, and uh, when Tim came out a few years ago, not in the way people usually come out, but you know, you know what I mean, came out as a, as a, as a low carber rather than a low, low fatter, um, he, uh, I honestly thought, oh, Tim, poor guy, he's finally lost it. You know, he's, I mean, he's, he's pushed the boundaries all these years and he's finally gone over the edge and, uh, you know, poor bloke, he's uh, getting on a bit. And, um, <laughs> but something, some little birdie in there said to me, hang on a minute, he's been right every other bloody time. You know, maybe he's right now. And uh, that got me started on my journey and, uh, and that's why I'm here today. And I just want to acknowledge publicly, uh, personally, uh, and I'm sure on behalf of all of you that uh, we owe Tim Noakes uh, a huge debt of gratitude.
<laughs> now, Tim is uh, one th another thing that he, Tim is very good at is making enemies, and uh, <laughs> he's made some some really good enemies over time. We have a. Uh, a, uh, a dietitian, sports dietitian in Australia by the name of Louise Burke, who's probably the most eminent sports dietitian in the world. And, um, and uh, she uh, loves her carbs, and uh, the fact that they're sponsored by Gatorade has nothing to do with it at all, I'm sure. <laughs> and um, so this is, uh, this is Louise. And uh, Louise was giving a lecture three years ago in, uh, in Melbourne and uh, came out with this statement. Brooklyn and Oak should be in jail. <laughs> and... Uh, she was pretty silly because there was a whole bunch of my friends in the audience and so they, uh, you know, they, maybe she wanted me to... Uh, but uh, anyway, but look, to be honest, I can't think of anything I'd rather do than spend time in jail with Tim Noakes. I mean... <laughs> imagine being able to pick that brain 24-7 for, uh, you know... I'd take six months, 12 months, so I'm happy to... Uh, I don't know about how you feel, Tim, but, you know, well... <laughs> But uh, as most of you would know, you know, Tim's copped an awful lot of flack uh, through this uh, process in, uh, in, in South Africa that uh, he's defeated once and, uh, and hopefully we'll hear very shortly that he's uh, defeated uh, twice. No one should have to go through, uh, through that. And I also want to acknowledge Marika, who's uh, sitting here, who's uh, been... Uh So there's, uh, there's Marika over there, and uh, live, live down there. Um, and uh, you know, Tim, we certainly hope that uh, there'll be good news uh, in the future. So just to conclude, um, this is a lovely, uh, lovely stat that I, uh, that I like to quote. This is from the World Health Organization, okay? You know, one of the few things they actually got right, I think. By 2020, two-thirds of all disease worldwide will be the result of lifestyle choices. <laughs> two-thirds. So that means that two-thirds of the NHS budget will be devoted to lifestyle. Yep. <laughs> no. Okay. Two-thirds of all teaching in medical school will be devoted to, be devoted to lifestyle. Yep. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, why not? Two-thirds of all disease. And yet, the vast number of doctors and senior medical people completely ignore it. I want to finish with, uh, with a story. I was standing in the coffee queue two days ago. That's my little addiction. A girl came up to me and said, uh, Dr. Bruckner? I said, yep. She said, oh, I was at your lecture uh, you know, the other day. I said, oh, that's good. She said, but that's not what I want to talk to you about. I said, oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> I said, oh, OK, gulp. Yeah, what would you like to talk about? And she said, four years ago, my, my husband's a cricket fanatic. And four years ago, because of your role with the Australian cricket team, we, uh, you influenced us to change our diet. And we dramatically changed our diet. And uh, my husband was bipolar, and he's now completely off his medication. It's completely changed our lives, and I just wanted to say thank you. And, uh, and I thought, well, times like that, you cop a lot of crap in this, uh, in this game, but times like that, you think, yeah, maybe it's worthwhile. So uh, um, how are we going? You know, what's, are we getting there? Well, there's this, uh, this great Maloney 16% rule you might, have, you might have heard of, that, you know, once you get to about 16% acceptance, then... Uh, then you're right, and uh, we're not there yet. But uh, you know, I think we're we're coming up this this slope here, and uh, we're getting up. I think even in the 12 months since I, I last spoke to you, I think we've made significant progress. And it's up to all of you people to uh, to spread the word. And uh, I thank you very much. <laughs>